Welcome to Conversations with Art Informal. Today, we have with us artists Miguel Aquilizan, Nairis Buenaventura, Jessica Dorizac, and Constantino Zicarelli. We will be talking about their ongoing exhibition at Art Informal Green Hills, Familiar Hunting, Unfamiliar Gathering. I'd like to know who coined the title of this exhibition. It's a very intriguing title, and I suppose there are many interpretations of it, but what was the intention for, for the title? I think it started with hunting and gathering, uh, because we all kind of collect, go out into the world and collect things and bring it back into the studio to work with and then unfamiliar gathering, because we all haven't had a show together ever, I think. We haven't shown our work together, so that's how it came together. This is not considered a four-artist show, which I originally thought. It's a group show. How were you put together? So it was very interesting because um, we all have the same kind of, um, I guess, sensibilities when it comes to working with material. And we also have mm -hmm. this correlation between each other as like an artist couple and how things cross over in yeah. terms of like subcon uh, unconsciously, like subconsciously, yeah. consciously. And then with that kind of dynamic and then how it worked as a whole. Seeing your recent works, it, I have the impression that you were able to put plenty of focus and concentrated effort during lockdown. Even based on the solo exhibition before this one, you have started experimentation on with, with, this, with this metal. Tell us a little bit more about your material experimentation. Basically, with my practice, I'm, I'm very interested in working with, you know, like materials in particular. And it was good enough that I started um, thinking about like what else I've learned throughout the years. And I studied gold and silver smithing in Griffith University, Queen's mm -hmm. College of Art. And then I managed to somehow like, you know, like translate those skills that I've learned and play with like copper. And yeah, like copper is such an interesting material to work with because it has all these different colors and patinas that happens when you put a lot of different elements into it. The exhibition notes mention that you are influenced by brutalism and I can see that. Well, for art informal viewers, brutalist architecture rose in the 1950s and it's characterized by minimalism, geometric shapes, um, monochrome color palette and also it shows bare building materials uh, focusing on uh, structural elements versus decoration. What was your interest in brutalism? I think the fact that it's it's those kind of ideas of brutalism that it, I was really drawn to it and mm -hmm. um, it's for me like working on those elements really like kind of pushed it because like the way like I'm making my work it's it is that it has elements of brutalism but it has form, yeah like the, the form yeah structure can you tell us a little bit more about walking man i was really drawn back again to the basic human form and okay. from there I, I started like experimenting on different ways on producing reproducing them into a more i guess like a modern take to it nice it seems that you have made a very exciting departure this year, which is <laughs> the, oh, okay. quite the yes. opposite of that. What this is an opposite motion. You were blocking out the text instead of creating the text. Right. Can you yeah. tell us a little bit about this? I know it's in, from an exhibition catalog. Yeah. Um, so we visited Camden Art Center in London while I was there taking my masters, and. Uh, I, I think three days before the opening of the show, I was tidying up and came across that again. I completely forgot about these, you know, these catalogs. So I happened upon that and then looked through it and chanced upon this passage that to me vaguely kind of defines what an echo is. And the, the main work that I have for our show right now is hum as a verb. So I'm using that one to preface that because, because hum as a verb is all about echoes. And that text, the text in that catalog has a, has a short line. Then we can move on to the main one. This is already in the realm of sound art. 
Yeah, surprisingly. I think nobody expected that. <laughs> I mean, I'm not a musical person. I don't know how to compose, you know, a melody. It's a work actually that was produced in 2019 for a workshop, that, a workshop class that I attended um, in school. And, you know, most of my classmates were musicians and they decided to make, you know, real compositions like songs ditties, things like that. And I decided to go the conceptual route only because that's what I'm comfortable with and it's something that falls within my skill set. So hum as a verb is basically exploring echoes as a sonic profile of a space. Because echoes, um, not many people know that echoes are unique to any given space, especially in closed spaces. And that when you fold it onto itself several times, it actually destroys the original source of the sound, for example, speech. So when you um, experience the, when you go into the room and experience insulation, at first you would hear a speech. It's actually, um, it's a speech performed by a computer, my computer back then. And it was reciting definitions of the word hum. Hum as a verb and hum as a noun. And um, I would play back that recording into the room, into the same room, record it again, play, play it back again, record it again, and through this repetitive um, process, in the end, the resonant frequencies of the room, or the echoes of the room, um, eventually destroyed the speech. So maybe I think towards the seventh or eighth cycle of the audio file, all you can hear would, um, would be the hum, and you can't, the, the speech is completely unintelligible. At this point, the idea is executed to be an ephemeral piece of work because it's just made of water. Um, it was, uh, the idea was conceived during the height of the storm season, you know, and we had really, maybe subconsciously, it's just me trying to process what happened, you know, wanting to repel or resist water. And this is something that would be pointed out to me later by my friend Alfred, that resistance is built into the work. And I agree with that because, you know, this was an exercise in trying to use a certain piece of technology, not necessarily software or hardware, but water resistant technology. So we have this like special kind of solution that we use to waterproof our affects, like, I mean, the personal effects, like, shoes or clothes and that's what gave me the idea to do water drawings. The sculpture which I know you, you mentioned you used a, a special paint. Yeah so that paint is called Gansai. It is what Weston is called Japanese watercolor and I, I really like the composition of the, the the material itself. The families who have made these colors, they've kind of kept it a secret, so nobody really knows what what's in, what it is composed of, uh, which I find really interesting. But I do work with it because I find it. I found them alongside my cardboard in Japanese temples, so kind of like a scavenger. So whatever I find, I use. The, these are all vintage cardboard, right? Yeah, they're all Japanese vintage cardboard. I'm gonna guess they're from like the 50s onwards. I think you even have like pieces from the 20s. Even from Some the really, 20s. really old, old, old. Some of them are even like handmade, yeah. just like. Some are hand-painted. Hand-painted, gorgeous. But are some printed? Some are printed like digitally printed, some are screen printed, some are, I think even hand painted or they've been through a process of like printmaking. Uh, I, I like how the, the, the diamond framing seems to contain the dynamism of the forms inside the patterns and the lines. And I can see behind you, there's another shape. So you play around with the, the shape itself of what contains these forms. There's a wood workshop in here in Los Banos who is run by a childhood friend of Miguel's. So when we started to work with him, he was, he's, he's teaching us how to use all the machinery and 
um, learning those skills, I was able to really start to experiment with making my frames, which is so important, I think, for like protecting my collages and as well as containing them because they are really quite strong, dynamic happenings in there. So to, to keep it together, yeah, that was like the next step in in our past interview, you were talking about how you're developing your shows is much like composing music, or it has something to do with music. It was like an old line I used to say in interviews. It's like every time I go in a show, I always treat it like an, a music or a new album. Like how I, they're like the same usual notes, but I always try to put it in different contexts, in different forms, different materials. So I always treat it like a new album for me. It's, it's just easier for me to understand my work. You sometimes mention, even in past shows, a, a beast. I'm sure the art informal audience is curious what, what, to know more, what about the beast? I don't know, it's like this sort of metaphor for me like going into the work and it's like really annoying because sometimes I can't figure out what way to or to work around these certain objects so like this sort of primitive looking, beast looking object that I can't really tend to figure things out with. Like referring specifically to the sculpture. Yeah. Yeah, I was actually talking with Miguel and Jess about how their works are so neat and clean. And if you put my work beside it, it's like really primordial state or like very primitive looking. And which actually, I actually like that because my earlier works, they were like so clean and shiny and very metallic. And eventually when you grow older, it's like you tend to once uh, sort of this maturity, like this sort of, like how Neil Young goes, uh, grows older, he looks more grungy. So I wanted my work to have that sort of effect, like this grunginess to these uh, materials. Yeah, it's like, uh -huh. it's like all handmade, like down to the sweat. So yeah, like very grungy approach to it. Um, in other countries, they call this the sonography. This is what Klaus wrote in a past interview. When I make a study, I make objects surrounding that study, like making a stage set. Is that what, you, what you're trying to achieve with, with these? Well, also my approach, also when I think of a show, I have like a certain idea what I want to show. But then I want to have like this sort of stage surrounding or like to set the atmosphere or the mood of the show. So I try to use different objects and found, found objects. Yeah, the, they, they look like hunting weapons. Is, does it have to do with the title? <laughs> yeah, Is it with, like that, yeah, has to do with the title? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, it's only now that I'm beginning to understand that part. Yeah, I always look through my older works, like works from five or eight years ago. It's like very clean. So I kind of wanted to step away from that form. I kind of wanted to like go in this direction that where, I don't know, it's like sort of this identity of me, like, like going back to the province, like you see like everything so still like in a way, not primitive, but undeveloped, underdeveloped. Thank you, everybody. Informal tries to do this because it's really important to share the information behind the work and the thoughts of the artists. And we hope it's going to, it succeeds yeah. in yeah. educating audiences. Thanks for your oh, time you. as well. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, staff. Bye. Uh, Bye. Okay. See ya. Thank you. Bye.